Two sleeping giants come out of a slumber in May of 1864. The Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia. They converge on an unassuming place out here in Orange County, Virginia. A location that would be forever known as the Battle of the Wilderness. That's where we are today. The Battle of the Wilderness battlefield here in Orange County, Virginia. Camp life during the winter of 1863 was a cold one. And the men built up huts, log cabins, and half tent, fl tent flats, uh, accommodations for themselves to get through the winter. And there were a lot of pictures taken that year to show the, the life of the camp itself and the soldiers um, in their everyday normal life out there. One of my favorite pictures from that time was a picture of the 17th Maine as they were doing drill. Uh, I believe it was on the 4th of May, 3rd or 4th of May. And it was right before they go into the fold out here, the Battle of the Wilderness. Now, the 17th Maine has a rough go of it out here at the wilderness. In that picture, when you take a look at it, you see a large body of men. And out of that large body of men, 507 men are drilling. When this battle is over with, they have 192 casualties and 54 men within a short couple of days would end up dead from that unit. A lot of the units in both armies are like that in these campaigns out here during May of 1864. Spotsylvania is a... Uh, it's a real bitterly contested fight as well. And a lot of men die out there at a place called the Mule Shoe. Now out here at the wilderness, during the 5th and 6th of May, a lot of the fighting is kind of like what it was in 1863 and 1862. It's out in the open. There are quickly thrown up defenses for men to get behind, but it's not the typical trench warfare that you see during siege work at uh, Petersburg and Vicksburg. Horace Porter wrote, all circumstances seemed to combine to make the scene one of unutterable horror. It was as though Christian men had turned to fiends in hell itself has usurped the place of earth. Of course they're talking about the fight that happened out here in the woods and fields and the hand-to-hand -hand combat that took place. The struggle was real. Fighting really hadn't looked like this. There had been tastes of it in previous fights around the Chancellorville area, Fredericksburg, in those pits and trenches but nothing quite like this. Fire had taken control and burned men who were alive still, who were in agony and couldn't peel themselves off the fields. The men around those guys were having to protect themselves from the battle so they couldn't stop to help. The army still continued on, still continued to do its thing, continued to fight as they listened to the screams and the moans in these fields around here, which one officer said actually drowned out the noise of battle itself. And can you imagine that? The screams of men who are burning alive was so loud that it actually drowned out the sound of cannons and muskets and charging soldiers across these fields. It must have been a horror, just like he said.
May 5th, 1864. Governor K. Warren ends up making this his headquarters. This mansion's called Elwood, or the Lacey House. I can just imagine him getting off his horse and walking up to this location, going right up these steps to enter this house. It's a great place for a commander to have a headquarters. It commands the field. To the rear, this is where a lot of the army is coming in from. Directly out front, or to the rear of this house, is where Warren's sending men into the battle. And then off in that direction over there, Grant ends up making his headquarters. So let's talk about the setup going into this battle here at the Wilderness. The Gettysburg campaign had taken place. In this photo that I'm gonna put up on the screen, you can actually see Confederate prisoners at uh, Camp Letterman in Gettysburg. Now those are some of the soldiers that represent about a third of Lee's army that he ends up leaving behind on that campaign. They're either taken prisoner they escape with their lives and disappear and go back home. Or they're injured severely and they're in those camps trying to get better. And a lot of them are just dead. Lee goes into the winter quarters after that campaign knowing a lot of those men cannot be replaced, especially the leaders. But this is what he has to deal with. He has a lot of the good generals that he had going into that campaign still left over. And Longstreet has been gone for some time because he had to go down to Georgia and Tennessee and fight in the army down there. But he ends up coming back up here just in the nick of time to be with the Army of Northern Virginia again. And Lee once again is out fighting with his old war horse, Gloomy Pete, General Longstreet. But unfortunately for Longstreet, May 6, 1864, would be his worst day in the Civil War, as he ends up getting shot by his own men, traveling down a road through the throat and into the right shoulder. And one of his trusted agents are there with him, ends up losing his life as well. So the Union Army is now on the move. Grant wanting to get across the river to find Robert E. Lee and to uh, make war on him where he could find him, decides to get his men up and going early on. He ends up sending Warren, followed by Sedgwick, and Germana Ford. Second Corps of Winfield Scott Hancock and Eli's Ford, or Ely's Ford. Now, those armies are moving in succession with each other with the idea that once they find the Confederate Army, they're gonna converge at that point and they're gonna make all out war on that army, hopefully separate it into pieces and then cause it to surrender or destroy it. But it doesn't work out that way for them because on the other side of this fight, just like the officers told General Grant, You've never fought Bobby Lee before. Now the Overland Campaign becomes something of a, I guess you could say like a seven days battle for General Grant. General Lee proved himself during the seven days battles at the, uh, the seven days battles in 1862 and pushed McClellan pretty much out of Virginia. Well, Grant is gonna do the same thing for Robert E. Lee during the Overland Campaign. He's gonna outwit, outmaneuver, and outfight. And he's going to attack him at all points, at any chance that he gets, no matter how much it costs, then lay siege to him, 
and cause that army and Robert E. Lee to surrender at Appomattox. Robert E. Lee finds out that Grant's on the move, and he decides to instruct Yule, uh, Ford on the Turnpike, and A.P. Hill on the Orange Plank Road. He sends them out. Grant, meanwhile, on the other side, ends up intercepting a message at some point from the flag officers saying, we are on the move, and the message was meant for Yule. Now Grant knows that the race is on. They have to get in position, they gotta get concentrated, and they gotta get to Lee before Lee gets to them. So another thing that ends up spoiling the plans here is early in the afternoon of the 4th, you end up having the Army of the Potomac halting in the wilderness due to the wagon trains being strung out. They could have continued on and pressed forward and probably made more progress towards the Army of Northern Virginia. But they didn't want to leave their wagon trains out to dry because they knew what happened in the past. The cavalry from the Confederacy loved attacking wagon trains, burning them to the ground, and stealing all the goods they could steal. So they halted, gave the wagon trains time to catch up and concentrate, and then they end up uh, delayed a little bit, which gives Robert E. Lee even more time to get his men in place over here in the wilderness. I'm out of a location now called the Chancellor House, and the reason why I'm here is because when Hancock's men was approaching the fight uh, that was about to happen over the Battle of the Wilderness, his men took camp out here at the battle or at the uh, battlefields of Chancellorsville, rather, in and around where the house used to be in the crossroads. Now the house had already been ruined because of a fire, and the fields were ruined because of battle. Farmers were still trying to plant out here, undoubtedly. But the soldiers talked about when they were camping out here, coming across bleached white bones sticking up out of the ground and skulls. Some of them poked at them and kicked at them and uh, made note of the ominous feeling that they had while they were in and around these fields. Things were a lot different though. It was no longer April of 1863 or May of 1863 either. It was 1864 and things had changed. Union soldiers were starting to write positive things in their diaries and letters about how they felt like they could win this war. Confederate soldiers were starting to talk a lot about hunger, a lot about not feeling so great about what was going on with their army. The tide had changed, but Confederate leadership was still as fervent as ever about whether or not they were going to win. They still firmly believed that they had the opportunity here at the Battle of the Wilderness to change things around. Robert E. Lee himself even wrote that the coming battle, if they lose, they have nothing to live for. But if they win, they have everything to live for. So he placed everything on this pa this battle that was coming. Meanwhile, the soldiers of Hancock's Corps were back here in these fields camping out at Chancellorsville. And uh, one soldier looked at another, an older soldier looked at a younger soldier. And he pointed at the bones at the ground and he told the man, that's what you're headed for just up ahead. He was a veteran and he knew what he was talking about. It was an ominous warning to the uh, younger soldiers that had not gone into the fray, had not seen the elephant just yet. And they would be meeting it that very next day at the Battle of the Wilderness. The 
the very next morning when Hancock's men get up and they get ready to go into the fight and they're traveling down these roads one soldier noted that the army had a dark and ominous feel about it they'd realistically just come out of winter quarters not too long ago packed up everything that they could pack up and headed across the Rapidan to get ready to find Robert E. Lee and the Confederate Army and make battle. Naturally, those men, well, they weren't feeling like, they weren't feeling like they, uh, the best times were coming. But not everybody in that army felt the same way. There were other soldiers, including Governor K. Warren himself in the United States Army Governor K. Warren rode back home and told them that he felt positive. He felt like good things were coming, that, uh, that they could win this war. In their camp, things had changed. 1862 was no longer a thing. Even 1863 was no longer a thing. The battles that happened in and around Chancellorsville was in the past. So the thicket of trees out here called the wilderness is so thick and tangled that now the armies are within five miles of each other. Neither army knows that. They can't scout out the, the area in between. It's too thick, there's no open fields. You can't even see the dust rising in the air because it's May. And even if the dust was to rise, you wouldn't be able to see over top of the trees in order to indicate that a large body of men are moving in any direction. So here they are sitting across from each other that evening, five miles apart, neither one of them knowing that they're about to run into each other. Just before bed, Lee sends out an order to Yule. And he tells Yule, move your men early in the morning and strike whatever you find. Yule says out loud, just the orders I like. Strike whatever I find. So he's got his blood up and he's ready to fight. And they're pretty positive about the campaign that they're going into. They still feel like they're the army that entered the Battle of Gettysburg. But they're not. So shortly after 7 a.m. on the 5th, Warren's men end up running smack dab in the middle of the Confederate skirmishers going down the turnpike. They can see off in the distance as the Confederates are filing to the left and to the right to go into the line of battle. And they're getting behind um, some timber and some thickets of trees. Well, the army halts. Meade decides to halt the army too because he doesn't yet want to put everybody into the fight. Warren is being very cautious. He wants to see what's going on out there. He sends men forward. The attack begins in earnest. Then the next thing you know, he slows it down again. He decides he really wants to see what he's, what he's facing. General Meade gets impatient with Warren and then sends a direct order to him, you will attack at once. General Warren has no, no other recourse but to take his men down the fields here, down the turnpike, and start fighting. And he does so, line by line, send them into the fight. And that is what gets us up to Saunders Field.
closest to the fight out here was old Baldy himself. Uh, Yule. They called him Baldy. Yule's men were out here ready to fight. And they were the ones that were lining off in the roads and going from the left to the right into line of battle. Now, it's, it's not the largest group of men, and uh, they're not quite ready and concentrated to fight. Knowing that, General Lee ends up sending word to Yule to slow his fight down, to not throw everything into the fight until they can get A.P. Hill to come up and join the fight, because he also knows that General Longstreet is still about 10 miles off. He's a good full day's march before he gets into the fight out here at the wilderness. So they want to be able to get as many men up and concentrate as they can because they know they're outnumbered at least two to one here in these fields. Now at this point, Charles Griffin is left behind to guard the turnpike. And that's pretty much where we're set up, where Warren is and the Army is for the United States Army, um, heading into the battle over at Saunders Field. Now over at Saunders Field on the east side, there's four brigades under Johnson. He's further extended south by Robert Rhodes. And that's what the Confederate lines are looking like as the, the fight starts getting real heavy over there at Saunders Field. So let's talk about Ayers Brigade now that we're out here. In the fields at Sanders Fields or Saunders Fields, Ayers Brigade comes swarming in for the attack. Now Ayers Brigade is made up of a lot of Zouaves. And if you know anything about Zouaves, they're a very colorful unit from New York. A lot of their uniforms are red or gold in color, big baggy pants. Um, I'll even throw some pictures up here for you to take a look and you can see what their uniforms look like. Now that you've seen that, think about being in the brush around gray and blue uniforms. You're fighting in those fields and the thickets are making it impossible for people to see each other. But you come bounding out of those woods wearing bright red and yellow. Maybe you're in the woods and the thickets wearing bright red and yellow and a lot of it. Well now you become an instant target for anybody that's looking to fire upon a Zouave. The battle at Saunders Fields becomes that contest that proves that the Zouaves, not only are they tough, but their uniforms make them very good targets. Because Ayers Brigade comes out of that fight with some pretty heavy casualties. But out of all the casualties, the majority of them happen to be the Zouaves. Out at Saunders Field, the 140th Zouaves leads the way, and they go rolling into the field. They end up veering left. As they veer left, the regulars end up falling out of the field. Uh, they get hit hard and get hit fast, and the regulars fail. Well, as they fail, they're rolling back, and two other Zouave units are coming up. The Zouaves see them and are curious, but they're not going to fall back. They get back into the fight. The 146th and the 140th are now in this fight together, tangled, and going towards the Confederates. And they end up being the backbone of the largest fight that happens there at Saunders Field. It's a pretty amazing moment for the Zouaves. Now all is going great for the Zouaves, the 140th, the 146th, until they near the tree lines there at Saunders Field. 
And what eventually happens is the Confederates open up a heavy fire on them immediately to their front. And it stops them like a brick wall. The Zouaves are basically halted in their path and annihilated right there at the front. So you can see the men who have been fighting so hard to get to that point at, at Saunders Field are now starting to be demoralized by the condition that they're in. Now, Lieutenant Shelton, with his U.S. battery, is out there on the turnpike. He's brought guns up with the intentions of unlimbering them and giving artillery uh, to support the fight that's happening at Saunders Field. But when the soldiers start falling back and the chaos starts happening around him, the Zouaves are directly out in front. He starts seeing his men getting picked off one by one, so he's in a hurry. He unlimbers his guns, he loads them as quickly as he can, and he starts to fire. But what he ends up doing is he ends up firing his guns right into the back of the Zouaves. A lot of the Zouaves commented about that, saying that that fire that came from behind and took out Zouave soldiers ends up being the thing that demoralizes them the most because now they don't know which way to work. They don't know where they're getting attacked from. They're actually getting attacked from their own men and they can't stand the canister fire from behind. So they end up having to fall back because of it. Now of that deadly canister fire that came from behind, the cannons that were unlimbered, Lieutenant Criven would later write, the shot went pouring through our ranks, badly demoralizing the heroes who were stemming the tidal wave of bullets pouring onto them. That's from the Lieutenant himself. So you can see, you can see the effect that's happening here. Um, the confusion of this place, the thickets, the trees, uh, the whirring of the bullets, the canister shot, the units themselves damaging each other. And it's also real clear as to why later on in this battle, James Longstreet himself ends up getting wounded by his own men. This place is a terrible place to make battle. It's now at this point that grisly hand-to-hand -hand combat starts to take place at Saunders Field. The Zouaves and all the soldiers, the Yankee soldiers, have come up to the line there in the tree line. And they're starting to pour into the location where the Confederates have made uh, quick breastworks to protect themselves. They are now fighting hand-to-hand. -hand. They're using bayonets to stab each other. They're clubbing their muskets to hit each other over the head. They're doing a tactic that they call braining, which is basically using your musket to mash the brains out of someone's head. And the fighting is so intense there that the amount of firepower that's concentrated in the location starts to set the underbrush on fire. And then they can start hearing people scream all around. They were laying on the fields catching fire. And this is only the first day of the battle. Just off in the distance there, there's a road that runs in this direction. The Union Army is actually coming up from this direction, and all their wagon trains are stretched out back that way. And the Army is traveling out there on that road, and is coming up through here, Warren's portion of the Army. Out here in these fields, this place looks a little bit like a small village, because this is a plantation. Today, it's just a big red house, and a, uh, 
a bathroom that the visitor center has put in over here for the national park. But there would have been all kinds of structures out here in this field. Probably one of the reasons why Warren decides to take this location as his headquarters when the fight starts. Now time for a little Ballifield orientation. So I'm out in the middle of Saunders Field right now. And this is one of the limbered carriages here for ordnance for a cannon that would have been placed out here. You can see Saunders Field stretches out in this direction. It's kind of a rolling flat open plain. And it goes up towards the heights there in front of us. You see the cannon there where the ditch is. And they talk about Winslow's battery placed out in here kind of off in this low-lying area. This is where he unlimbered and started firing into the back of his own men, killing not only the Confederates up on the hill, but his own men from the Zawaz. In this position back here, where the tree lines are, Union soldiers are approaching from that direction, and they're stretching out and they're moving over here. You have the Zawaz, like we talked about, the 140th, the 146th, uh, mostly New Yorkers that are coming up through here from Ayers uh, Brigade. And then up on the hill, we have the Confederates stretching out across the turnpike. On the left-hand side here, the units that we talked about, the four brigades uh, earlier in the video. And we'll put the map up on the screen so you can see. Um, you can take a look at that map and look at the, the individual units over there. And you notice, looking at the Confederate line for that first day's battle, uh, it sort of looks like a thin line of men on either side. Not everybody is up and ready for the fight. You'll notice that Longstreet's not on that map showing up. And you'll notice that Hancock is also not present for the fight or Burnside. So this is what you get on that first day battle, that first initial attack, when you have Governor K. Warren out here in the fight. Now that place that we went to, uh, Grant's headquarters, again, you go back down the turnpike here, head in that direction, about a mile off in that direction past Elwood, which is on this side of the road. Grant's headquarters is on this side of the road. Stretching out directly behind me here is Saunders Field that we were talking about in the earlier videos. And you can see it. It's a wide open, beautiful plain out here. And it's one of the rare spots in the wilderness where the fields are cleared. The only time that you see cleared fields out here without trees or stretches of land that's developed by farmers. And in this, this neck of the woods, so to speak, there's really not that many farmlands that are cleared and developed out here. Even Elwood itself was like some five, 6,000 acres of land, and he only had about 100 acres developed, which was a lot at the time uh, for farming. So you can understand why it is when they went into the fight out here, they ended up fighting each other uh, in, in such horrible conditions for Napoleonic warfare. Uh, you can't really line your men up left to right, shoulder to shoulder, and march them across the field when they, there's a bunch of trees and briars in the way. And not to mention, when you're directing lines of men to go into battle and meet up with other lines, like what happened over my shoulder over here, you have confusion, just like you did when uh, they wheeled to the left when they were supposed to meet up directly with the line on their right. So out here in these fields directly behind me, Saunders Field, the 140th and 146th stood strong and took the brunt of the conflict out here um, when the Confederates poured it into it. And how do we know this? Well, 
If you look at the casualty count. They brought 1,600 men into the fight out here. And out of the 1,600 men, 567 of those men end up being left out here, either dead, wounded, or captured by the enemy. That's a lot of soldiers to be leaving behind. And some have to wonder if maybe their uniforms might have played a part in that. Now on the other side of this fight, on the field here at the initial portion of the turnpike, General John Marshall Jones from the Confederacy is out here, and he's trying to rally his men during an attack. Jones ends up getting shot just above the brim of his hat, falls off his horse, and ends up mortally wounded as they carry him away from the lines. He ends up dying out here as a result of his wounds at the Battle of the Wilderness. He was once an officer of, tac of the tactics department at West Point, but he ends up choosing to become an officer in the Confederacy instead, which leads to his death here at the Wilderness. There's a picture of three officers from Georgia that are fighting out here as well. These three officers are in the same unit and they're fighting with the 4th Georgia. And during a counterattack, the man all the way on the right hand side ends up dying. His last name was Hawkins. Now, he's the youngest of the three. In the entire group, you have Captain Howard Tinsley, Major William Willis there in the picture. And then you have Eugene Hawkins. Hawkins does not survive the battle. Now those are wobs cross over this field right here behind me. And they make it all the way up here to this point. And we're about to go into the tree line now to where some of the, the breastworks are still placed today from that battle. It's a pretty amazing thing. They come all the way across this open field with fire from all around. And when they get to this location here, that's when the Confederates open up on them and stop them dead in their tracks. And the Zouaves leave many of their men behind in those fields behind me there. Now today, out on these fields, you can just still make out the breastworks running along this little ridge here from the Confederates. They were built out here in 1864 to protect them during the Battle of the Wilderness. And you can see all those trees behind us, behind the, the breastworks there, and the type of th thick brush that's out here. Now we're still in the very beginning of spring, so nothing's leafed out. It's not yet May over here it's March and out there's Saunders Field stretching all the way across so if you're up here on this hill you probably feel pretty confident because you can see everything out in front of you you can see the men stretching out coming towards you they can't really see you so somehow up here on these lines Wadsworth manages to break through the Confederate lines and he tears a pretty significant hole in here and has a very, very big opportunity to split the Confederacy in half, the Confederate soldiers and their units in half up here. Yule seeing this immediately sends back to get Gordon to come up here and plug in the hole somewhere out in this area where I'm at right now. Somehow in the fields behind me, Colonel Rice ends up inadvertently wheeling his unit to the left. And then what happens is he basically exposes his flank. All of this happens at the same time as Gordon comes up to plug the hole. And the opportunity is lost. Not to mention that inadvertent wheel cost Rice a lot of his men. Those guys end up taking firepower on their flank 
which runs down the line of men and not at the front. And they end up having to flee back across the field. Now in these fields that I'm at right now, Saunders Field, at this location, a third of the men that died at the Battle of the Wilderness, that happened right here, out in these woods, out in this field. Ayer's Brigade comes in here and leaves behind 633 Zawaz. Now it's a large unit that Ayer's has. His total casualty count for that was about 936. You can imagine. It's a lot of people to leave behind from one special group. And they all thought they were pretty special because of their uniforms. Perhaps it might have been the uniforms that caused so many of them to perish out here at Saunders Field. Just off of the trees out here, again, you can see as I'm walking down this path, more earthworks on the outskirts of Saunders Field. Now there's a road that you can drive down and take a driving tour. And that driving tour, it, it takes you past some pretty large earthworks that are out in a clear open field. So you don't have to walk down a path if you don't want to. But I still think it's real neat to get out here and see some of these things. Now what I've got behind me here is a very unique opportunity uh, for me to kind of show off the zigzag patterns. You can see these trenches here, this uh, earthwork, the breastworks, kind of sitting up high here. But if you follow it back, you see a gap here underneath the tree right there. That goes off in that direction and then it circles back around. When you take the trail out here at Saunders Field, where John B. Gordon end, ends up making the flank attack on the 6th of May, 1864, you get to see a lot of the original earthworks still out here today. Uh, they're very low, probably due to erosion and rain and people stepping on them and things like that. But it's really neat to see it. I'm walking away from the street right now and I am noticing how eerily silent this place has become. It's swallowing up the sounds of my own footsteps as I walk. Kind of makes your skin crawl just a little bit. Now it's at this point in the fight that the lines are starting to dig in. They're about 300 yards apart and they're digging in deep. Nobody wants to give up ground from where they're at, but none of them kind of seem to want to go back across that field just yet. Meade sends dispatches back to Hancock, and he tells them to come up and order Sedgwick to the Brock Road so that he can protect that crossroad out there, because they know if they lose that intersection, Lee can use that to his advantage. So that's what happens. Hancock starts to make haste, and Sedgwick goes up to the Brock Road. Out here at the Brock Road in the intersection, Geddes ends up running into Heth's division and it becomes a hotly contested fight. Wadsworth and Heth's doing every, or Wadsworth and Geddes are doing everything that they can to maintain the location that they're at and Heth is pushing them back, and it's working for a while for the Confederates. 
down this area here is the Brock Road that we're talking about. And this is where the Union troops are coming down. And they're pushing towards that intersection. They're filling in from all around. And they're coming from this direction as well as they're headed towards that Brock Road Orange Plank intersection. Now at the time that the fight starts happening out here at the Brock Road, Lee goes out to the Widow Tap field. And I'll take you over there in a second so you can see that field and the clearing that's out there. And he realizes he has an opportunity to set up guns out there for artillery. That's one of the strengths that they have. So he brings his artillery out there and he places them in the field out there towards the uh, towards the junction that he's trying to protect or trying to fight for. He puts 12 guns out there trying to hit the plank road, orange plank road. And then that's when the fight for the orange plank road really begins. Now we're taking a look at things from the Confederate point of view. If you take a look at the distance behind me here, that's Saunders Field. And all of these works that are wrapping behind me are Confederate earthworks that are still out here from the Battle of the Wilderness. They're pretty deep over in this location where the clearing is. You can see the, uh, the cannon set up in the background there. Artillery piece facing off in this direction. And this is where the men would have been located when those first initial attacks happened, coming across that field in this direction. This is where the Zouaves were coming and trying to capture this location. This is uh, it's a pretty neat view from here. We're going to head over to a location that shows the, the earthworks wrapping around um, and you can get a real good view of the full length of the line. Most of the earthworks today are out here in the, in the tree line and it's, it's hard to see them. Out in this location here you can actually see the earthworks behind me stretching around. And as I move around across Sanders Field or Saunders Field, you can see just how long this line stretches. It runs all the way down there behind me into the woods. When the Federals came pouring out of the woods across the field over here and down that turnpike directly to my rear, there was roughly 6,000 of them that were trying to make their way up here. And the Confederates poured into these fields to the left and to the right and immediately started putting up their breastworks. The roar of battle was on, on May 5th, 1864. And from that point forward, they started fighting on a one mile long stretch from my, my right hand side to my left hand side. And it would continue to rage on until the night before everything stopped to a lull and then commenced the next day, early in the morning, before the sun even came up. So where I'm going out to now is called the Higgerson Farm. Now Miss Higgerson, she was a uh, a nice looking old lady, meaning she had a very mean face. Um, she owned the farm out here, her family owned the farm out here, and it was one of the only clearings that was in the area during the Battle of the Wilderness. You can see behind me here, it's a nice beautiful open field great place for combat if you're doing Napoleonic warfare Miss Higgerson did not take kindly to the Union Army being on her property she comes out of her house and she is berating the Yankees yelling at them cursing at them and she's predicting their demise one soldier from Pennsylvania said, we didn't pay her much attention until we had to fall back. She was right about their demise. They didn't get to keep the location that they're at right now here at the Higgerson Farm because the Confederates would come upon them and fight them and push them out of this location. Today I'm going to head out there towards where the house is and you'll see there's not much left just a few rocks on the ground from where the chimney used to be placed for the old farmhouse. 
and I'll see if I can't find a picture to post online of what the house used to look like. Now here in a second you'll see what's left of the Higgerson house right behind me. And that's that bunch of rocks that are stacked up back there that used to be the chimney stack for the house. The house is facing in this direction, the direction I'm walking in right now. And the old woman's outside of her house yelling at these Union soldiers that are pouring across her field, probably trampling her crops and scaring her animals off and all that sort of stuff so probably not a uh, unrealistic reaction to thousands of men pouring across your field and destroying your property um, for her vitriol was most likely influenced by her feelings for the other soldiers too when the Pennsylvanians had to come back across this field, they remembered that old woman and they remembered what she had to say when she was out on her front porch. I'm walking the uh, farm road towards the tuning farm, or at least the location of where the tuning farm was because the house is no longer there. During the Battle of the Wilderness, the farm uh, was looted for everything that it had. But thankfully, the farmhouse itself wasn't burnt down to the ground and it wasn't destroyed. So Mr. Tuning was able to move back into his home and continue his life out here in the middle of the wilderness. When Crawford moved his men in over here, it looked like it was a good point to exploit an advantage facing the Confederates. But he soon found out that this location where the tuning farm was, was kind of a no man's land. And it became a gap in between the two armies that eventually would be closed up by A.P. Hill. Now Getty's advances, and he's fighting, and he's receiving a terrible volley to his front, and he ends up asking for assistance. He gets that assistance when Brigadier General Hayes shows up with his men. Hayes gets to his position and starts forming up his men. He's on horseback, and when he gets to that position where he's at, he starts to stop and talk to some of the men from his old unit the 63rd. But by the time he stops, Hayes is hit 
by a bullet. And Brigadier General Hayes ends up dying here at the Battle of the Wilderness. Now General Hayes, I talked about in a previous video. An outstanding man. One heck of a soldier. But he was also a very dear friend to General Grant and General Hancock. Upon learning of his death, it seemed to devastate the general. And he couldn't take it. I'll take you over to the location where he was mortally wounded here at the Battle of the Wilderness. Out here on a busy, uh, on the busy road, the Brock Road, is the monument that stands to General Hayes, which is directly behind me here. Out in this area somewhere is where General Hayes fell mortally wounded when coming up along his line here um, and talking to the 63rd Pennsylvania as he was standing somewhat in this area or on the back of a horse a bullet hits him and kills him. Nighttime comes in these fields on the evening of the 5th of May. And darkness starts to surround these people left and right. Officers notice stragglers trying to make their way back. Men are scared. They're confused. They don't know where they're at. During the daytime, this place is so confusing walking through the woods that it's very easy just to get lost. Even today, myself, I was out on a trail with blue dots trying to direct me which way to go. And at one point I actually questioned whether or not I was heading in the right direction. These men didn't have blue dots to guide them through and it was the middle of the night. And all night long these men are hearing the crackling flames on some of the fields. They're hearing the screams of the wounded, the dying. They can hear their comrades shivering and crying because of the fear that they feel from the battle that happened that day. And they know that the only thing that they got to look forward to is the sun coming up the next day. And more of the same. Now at this location, the tuning farm, it may not seem like a whole lot. It's just a big wide open field when you get out here. There's no buildings in place, there's nothing out here to kind of indicate anything other than a couple of signs from the National Park Service to let you know what happened out here. But if you look over my shoulder, as I pan back around in this direction over here, you can see the remains of the Parker Store Road. That was an old road that used to run through here that brought you out to the Parker store. It was a farm road. It was traveled often by the farmers that are out here. And it's the only thing that breaks up this dense wilderness out here that's not the orange plank or the turnpike or the brock. It's just a dirt road. Basic plain dirt road. Well, the Union Army knows that there's a gap between Saunders Field which is in that direction, and a gap between the fight that's happening over at the uh, Brock Road intersection and the Plank Road. Back this way over here. They decide they're gonna send troops up through this country road and fill that gap with Union soldiers and then possibly attack on the flanks of the Confederate Army. A.P. Hill and Lee realize that's about to happen. So they send Hill out here to fill this gap. He rushes out here in this location, but on May 6th, when he's getting up early in the morning to get out here, he's almost taken captive. He sees the troops coming, and he doesn't have a whole lot around him to protect himself. 
He tells his horsemen quietly, get on your horse, grab your reins, turn around, ride away, and don't look back. They listen to him and calmly move. And they avoid capture out here and disaster for themselves at the tuning farm. Later on, another thing happens. Lee and A.P. Hill are out here having a conversation on the porch of the tuning farm. And there's a hole in the top of the building. And one of the soldiers sticks his head out the top and takes a look down these fields across behind me. They see artillery pieces moving away from the wilderness. Grant is back on the move. This time, his destination is towards Spotsylvania. He's trying to get to Richmond. Lee now has to shift his entire army, and seeing that happen, he wants to advance and beat him to the crossroads yet again. And that ends up bringing on the Battle of Spotsylvania, where some of the fiercest fighting in the year of 1864 actually takes place. One of the deadliest conflicts and some of the most severe hand-to-hand -hand combat ever happens right there at Spotsylvania, especially at a place called the Mule Shoe Salient. Now for some battlefield orientation. I want to put the map up and talk you through that first initial fight as it's going down the Orange Turnpike. If you look on the map on the screen, you see Johnson's off to the left-hand side and you see Early is off to the right-hand side for the Confederates, right there on the left-hand side of your screen. Going across the way, looking at the Yankee side, if you're looking at the Union soldiers in the direction that they're going, you have Ricketts off to the right, Griffin himself is set up in the center, and Warren is back at his headquarters near the Lacey Farm. All the way off into the rear, however, you can see Getty where Grant is set up, and Wheaton. Wheaton and Getty are headed down towards that Brock Road intersection that I was telling you about, the Brock Road and Orange Plank that we're gonna go to. All throughout the section where the Confederates are is Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, and a few other various units like Alabama. All throughout the fields, Saunders Fields and such, for the Yankees, the Northerners have Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin, and various other units including artillery pieces that are out there and the special units of the Zouaves. Now Burnside gets into the fight out here too, and his men come up, but they come up late. They come up slow. And really, this is the moment for Burnside to come out here and impress General Grant. He has the full opportunity to do so, but he squanders that opportunity. His unit's very slow getting up, he takes his time, and he's not impressive out here at this field. He's also not impressive anywhere else that he fights when he's going through the Overland Campaign. Therefore, it's no surprise that during the Battle of the Crater, when Burnside makes those changes and the fight unfolds the way it does there, he's removed from command. Grant is not impressed. May 5th of 1864, Grant comes out here to this clearing that's kind of behind me here. This place was, was cleared out. It's a, an overlooking place towards the fields in front of me. Saunders Field is directly ahead. It's about a mile down the road. Grant makes his headquarters out here with General Meade. He gets out here and a reporter notices that he's sitting on a stump. He's whittling wood. 
He's making piles of shavings at his feet. He's constantly puffing on cigars. People are coming in and out of the camp, and he's sending orders out. He's talking to General Meade. General Meade is really directing a lot of the fight that's happening out here because Grant's not trying to step on anyone's toes. He's in charge of the entire army. General Meade is in charge of the Army of the Potomac. So General Meade is being advised by Grant, but General Meade's in charge. So out here in this location, something significant happens that kind of speaks to the type of relationship the two had with each other and the relationship that Meade actually had with his subordinates. Meade's out here, and Griffin comes riding up on a horse, and he's angry as hell. Nothing's going right for Griffin at the time. He jumps off that horse, and he passes Grant and goes directly to Meade. And he starts cursing up a storm. He starts yelling at Meade. He tells Meade that uh, Warren has failed him. He tells Meade that his army has failed him. He tells Meade that even headquarters has failed him. Griffin hops back on his horse, rides off, still angry, and Meade's standing there. And he was calmly listening the entire time and not really going back at him. And Meade's known for his temper. Grant comes over to him. And he looks at him and says, who is this Greg? Who is this General Greg? Meade looks at him and corrects him. He says, it's not Greg, it's Griffin. And he said, that's just the way he talks. He reaches out to General Grant and kind of like a father figure, buttons one of the buttons on the top of his coat and kind of dusts him off a little bit. It broke the tension between the two and then Grant listened to him, walked away, and never talked about it again. He just let it go. And that showed the, the confidence that Meade had in his men, but it also showed the patience that Meade exhibited towards his men during battle as well. I mean, he could be an angry, ornery person to deal with, but he also understood the, the, um, the heated moment that they were in, and he understood why that man was feeling the way he was feeling. Now, still out here near General Grant's headquarters at the Battle of the Wilderness. And this battlefield holds some unique features all throughout the woods out here. You can still see clearly marked out here on the ground in front, running along this ridge here, earthworks that are still in place. Um, you would have had probably cannons out here because it was a cleared area. And not to mention, this is a good defensive position if the army has to fall back from its spot over in Saunders Field even further from where it is, then this is probably going to be a good place for them to fall back to. Because there's still a good clearing in front of them, and if an army retreats, it, it should not completely run from the field, it should have a fallback point. So that's what we have here in front of us. I'm now at it that, uh, that crossroad, that intersection that we talked about earlier, Orange Plank and Brock Road. You can see the crossroad right behind me. And I'm on the trail that they have out here near one of the uh, Civil War Trail signs. This area was a pretty significant area both May 5th and May 6th. Hill's men started rushing up this location on the Orange Plank Road somewhere around afternoon on uh, the 5th of May. At the same time, unbeknownst to him, Getty had been sent up in this direction as well. And the point was to try to take the crossroads behind me. The Vermonters are out here. And in a minute, I'll be over at a uh, monument to Vermont. Some of the works that they put out here are still visible today along the Brock Road. That afternoon, for about six hours, the Confederates from A.P. Hill and the Vermonters along with Gettys and the men that would come up in, in this location with him ends up fighting here. Hundreds of men fall in these woods. And this intersection becomes very costly. 
It's almost to a stalemate on that first day. But by May 6th, things start to change. Geddes gets reinforcements. He starts pushing the Confederates back. And he ends up fighting them almost all the way back to the Widow Tap Farm. And back in that location, if you remember, we just talked about Robert E. Lee is back there. And he is with his artillery. And the battery is stood up, firing off in this direction. And that's when he makes some famous remarks from that field about the Texans. Now for some battlefield orientation. Now we're going to put the map up here and take a look at it real close. Try to find the Orange Plank Road and the Brock Road. The Brock Road crosses and intersects with the Orange Plank Road. And you can see the name Gettys there, along with Wadsworth and A.P. Hill. Now that's the opposing sides. Now I'm going to take that down. Out in this direction is the Brock Road. Out in this direction is the Orange Plank Road. It runs back here. Widow Tap Farm is back that way. And off in this direction, Vermont is all throughout here. On day two, Wadsworth comes up and they end up dissolving the Confederate front. They push them back about a mile or so, off in this direction over here. Uh, and now you can see kind of the traffic flowing. That's the orange plank road that we're talking about. And they push those Confederate soldiers off in that direction about a mile or so. And the Widow Tap Farm is back there. Now take a look all around me and tell me what you see. I am out in a cleared area. This is actually an area that has been cleared out specifically for trail walking. It has a nice trail in it and everything. During the fall, this place is nice and open. And you can still somewhat see, even though the roads behind me disappear because of the thick trees that are around me. During the fight here, May 5th and May 6th, 1864, this location became choked with smoke. The firepower was so great here that when a line would light up, men said that they thought it was lightning. It lit up the forest as the guns went off. And then the smoke would just sit low and hover real thick. So now not only could you not see, you could not see because of these trees, but you also can't see because of all the smoke. But then something terrible happens out here. The sparks from the guns are so concentrated that it hits all this dry brush here. Dead leaves, briars, dead trees, and it sets it on fire. And out here in these fields, you have hundreds of men laying on the ground. They're wounded. They're, they're moaning from pain. They're asking for help. They're asking for water. They can't do anything for themselves. They're just laying there on the ground. And then this place catches on fire. In the melee, all these soldiers are in combat with each other, so they're fighting. They're going back and forth in battle lines. They're following orders. They're doing what they're supposed to do. But the men that are on the ground can't do anything. They're helpless. Some of them are trying to crawl away. Others are so badly wounded that they can't crawl away. And the fire starts to get closer. The heat starts to increase around them. And before too long, it's right next to their bodies and they start burning up. The flesh starts melting off of their bones. These men scream from the agony and the pain and eventually the screams become muffled and they die. Many of the veterans that fought out here talked about the, those screams. 
the nightmares that they had about it. This was a horrible place to be, May 5th and May 6th, 1864. And it was a time that would live in those veterans' memories that made it out of here alive for the rest of their lives. They never forgot the fires here at the wilderness. Now just like the monument said back there, Vermont suffered over 1,200 casualties out here in these very woods. That meant a lot of their wounded comrades were part of that fire and burned up out here. This is an amazing place to be, a confusing place to be at that. And it wasn't any different on the other side. The Confederates that fought out here suffered greatly too, except the casualty count as a whole for the Confederate Army here at the Battle of the Wilderness was a lot less than the losses suffered by the Union soldiers. Almira Patterson lost her husband out here in these fields. But that's not all she lost. Because of the laws where she lived in Birmingham, Pennsylvania, she had to sell her house at Orphan's Court to support her family. She received a pension of $350 a year from her husband's service. She sold the house, she sold the property, she sold a lot of her things, and then in 1868, one of her three children died of scarlet fever. She never fully recovers from this, and then she dies in 1910, a widow. It's pretty amazing the suffering that people went through as a result of this war. Now back in Yorkville, South Carolina, there was another woman that was mourning and suffering. Miss Jenkins learned that her husband, Micah Jenkins, was out here right off the Orange Plank Road with uh, General Longstreet. And as they were riding up, Micah Jenkins was shot in the head by some of his own men. As Jenkins was being carted off the field, one soldier said, that they could see Jenkins cheering on his men. For some reason, somehow, he was still able to do that. But Jenkins ends up dying because the bullet went through his brain. She too also suffered the same fate as a lot of the families, just like Almira Patterson suffered, with a husband gone and a house in disarray and being left to fend for herself back home in Yorkville, South Carolina. Those families are the ones that suffered the most. Directly behind me here is a monument that was placed in honor of Wadsworth. And out in this location here is where he actually uh, took the bullet that mortally wounded him and caused him to die. In this location, he's trying to resist the fight that's happening here. He's trying to stop the Confederates from pushing back and taking that Brock Road and uh, Plank Road intersection. But there is a, an attack that's launched by Moxley, thanks to Longstreet, and they find an unfinished railroad cut to kind of sneak down and through and come around the side. As a result of that sneak pass and that sneak attack, Wadsworth is here in this location and he ends up losing his life. You also have Major Henry Abbott who also dies as a result of the fighting in this location too. So this is some pretty tough hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting out here but you can tell by the location where this is the Union soldiers had fought and pushed the Confederates from a long distance. Directly behind me that road going stretching back in that direction, it's about a half a mile or so already, maybe even three quarters of a mile where the Confederates started their fight. And they got pushed back past this point where Wadsworth is right now. So they, they were victorious for a chance there for a moment. And then Longstreet comes into play. And the next thing you know, the fight's pretty much over with here 
on the Orange Plank Road for these Union, union officers and soldiers. walking out in the field that was once known as the Widow Tap Farm. It was because the old lady that used to live here and her farm. The General Lee came over to these fields during the battle and realized it was a bit of a ridge and a clearing and he could get artillery pieces over here and aim those artillery pieces towards that intersection that's so valuable. Because, number one, if those soldiers come up around the plank road and they're on this area, they can get to the flank of Lee's army, which is over near Saunders Field, the majority of them. Number two, if they can get cannons over here and place them in this location, they can then support the fight that's happening with Heth over at uh, the Brock intersection with, with the Union Army over there in Gettys. And... This is kind of a fallback point. They have always been good at finding fields out here near this area in the Chancellorsville battles and other battles around here to place cannons so that they could make it advantageous for them and fight and drive off the artillery pieces in the other direction. But this time it was of necessity that they get them placed over here. By the next day, on May 6th, the Union soldiers have started to push the Confederate Army back in this area. They've driven them a mile to a mile and a half back. And it's so bad, it's to the point to where General Lee is getting so frustrated and worried that he's coming up to General Gregg and asking him, basically, what's the matter with your men? Are they not fighters anymore? Why are they fleeing? And of course, those soldiers were being pressed very heavily. And he tells Lee that essentially, my men are, they're falling back in order. They're not retreating from the field. They are still willing to fight. Well, in the nick of time, you have General Longstreet showing up. For a few moments on that spring day, The Confederate Army faced disaster. General Longstreet's corps arrived, and he kept everything cool. Longstreet says, we'll straighten this thing out shortly. Lee rides up, and as he's looking out across these fields, where Longstreet's men are, he then looks out and says to Greg, who are those men over there? And Greg says, those, those are the Texans. Lee shouts, hurrah for Texas. And then he gets excited, he gets up in his stirrups, and he yells, the Texans always drive them back. Or something to that effect, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But he's very excited about the Texans being here, and, and, and that surge of men coming across his field. So you can imagine, uh, Lee is probably feeling like he's on the brink of defeat at that point. Because, like I said, if that army comes down this road and it ends up hitting them, it's going to hit their flank and they're done. Well, it saved them. Longstreet comes up. He pushes his men forward. And they end up driving those Union soldiers back to the Brock Road intersection and beyond. As a result, like I said earlier, Grant ends up realizing he's not going to win here. So he takes his men and he moves further on and ends up at Spotsylvania. But Lee gets so up in his saddle about this whole situation that he then starts to ride a little bit too far forward. And he starts cheering on his men and hollering and telling them to keep going, keep moving forward, press those men, move those people. Well, the soldiers around him start to realize, holy crap, General Lee is out here amongst the regular soldiers and too far forward, he's in danger. 
So then they start yelling, Lee to the rear. General Lee, you must go to the rear. They grab his horse and they startle him. And he yells at them to let go of his horse. But then, reluctantly, he realizes he is too far forward. And if he dies, then a lot of the men will have a hard time with that. So, he backs up and he goes to a safer location and allows his army to continue to fight and do what they've been doing all those years leading up to this point. But again, as a result of Longstreet being out here at this position, he saves the day and the Confederates live to fight another day. Once Texas is in the fold and the fight gets pushed back in this direction, everything that the Northern Army gained up until this point is now lost. The Confederates are pushing them back inch by inch. And eventually, the Union soldiers are back behind the breastworks that they had across the, the Brock Road. The Confederates are stymied. They're stuck where they're at. Grant, realizing that he can't make any headway where he's at, decides that he's going to take his army and continue to move. But this time, instead of turning around and moving in the opposite direction, he makes that famous turn that lets his entire army know that this is not the same general as all the other generals they fought with before. This man's gonna to continue to press towards Richmond and he's gonna to continue to fight. Men cheer. The officers try to get them to calm down. There's no calming them down. They know Grant's gonna bring the end of the war soon. For a little battlefield orientation. The widow's house and farm is over there, off in that little area. Back behind me here, you can see an artillery piece off in the distance. This is where Lee's placed a lot of the artillery that's facing the Orange Blink Road. Longstreet's come up in this direction, and his men are getting into line of battle and moving out. Somewhere out in this area is where Lee famously says, the Texans always move them. Hurrah for Texas. Right out in this area here. That's also where he gets told to get to the rear. That's that orange plank road that we were talking about, and it travels down in that direction where the Brock Road intersection is. And off in this direction, Saunders Field and the two houses that we went to earlier, or the locations of the two farms that we went to earlier is off in that direction. Now, I'm at the Whittle Tap Farm out here, and I'm gonna talk about something that happened on the orange plank road right there ahead of me. And the reason why I'm talking about it here is because the stop out here at this battlefield for you to pull off is about two cars deep. You really don't have a lot of space to, to walk around or do anything. There's no trail out there that's special. The actual action happened out here on the Orange Plank Road. And uh, it's just dangerous in the first place to be goofing around out there with a camera in your hand. So, um, But Longstreet and his staff are riding up this road. And they're headed towards that Brock intersection. They're scouting out areas and they're trying to figure out what they can do to take advantage of the situation that they're in. And just like General Jackson, Longstreet and staff come under friendly fire. Now you gotta remember, we're out here in the wilderness. So the men that are on either side of this road, they don't know what's going on in between. They just know that something's moving around and uh, they begin to fire. Well, the officers around Longstreet start yelling, friend, we're, we're your friend. They didn't listen to him, and they continued to fire. And as a result, a couple of men go down. One of those men die. Another man, General Longstreet, takes a bullet to his throat and ends up going into his right shoulder. It puts him out of commission for quite a while. 
and it nearly cost him his life. But the irony of it all is it happened in May of 1864, one year earlier, General Thomas Stonewall Jackson would also be wounded by friendly fire, and he would also suffer a severe wound as a result. But unfortunately for Jackson, he ends up dying of his wound because he contracts pneumonia and dies of sickness just a few short days later. As promised, I'm now in that location where I talked about lead to the rear, lead to the rear. And you can see directly behind me here is the Confederate trenches. And there's a sign here placed that's talking about Lee yelling hurrah for Texas and his men grabbing him and moving him back and yelling at him to get to the rear because they're worried about their general dying out here on this field. They don't want Robert E. Lee to die. Um, they don't want anyone to die really, but Robert E. Lee is a, a figurehead of their, of their fight here. And um, he's probably one of the most masterful generals that they have on the field and they know it. So they're trying to get him out of the, uh, trying to get him out of harm's way, really. And out here at this same location is a monument to Texas. The Texas Brigade that came out here and fought uh, so wonderfully for General Lee at the Battle of the Wilderness. So what does this really cost out here? Well, for the Union, we're looking at between 14 and 17,000 casualties. For the Confederates, anywhere between seven and 11,000 casualties. For both sides, very valuable officers end up dying. Several high-ranking officials die out here in these fields. Hayes, one of them. Longstreet takes a bullet to the throat that puts him out of commission, and he could have died out here too. You have Wadsworth, you have Hayes, you have many other officers just like them out here on this field fighting for their lives and they all end up perishing. In the end, this is a, I guess a victory for the Confederacy, but it doesn't do more than just stop the Union from traveling in this direction. Grant pushes off, ends up in Spotsylvania, thousands more die. Grant pushes off and goes further south. Ends up down in North Anna. More people die there. Eventually, with the Overland Campaign, Grant ends up in Petersburg, takes siege to the town, ends up taking the town, ends up taking the railroads, and ends up taking Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox in 1865. Effectively, bringing a real end to the majority of the fighting, especially the fighting on the East Coast. It's a costly victory for sure here at the Battle of the Wilderness, but it's one that neither side will ever forget, especially when talking about the fires in the fields that surrounded this area. If you ever have the time, make sure you stop and come walk these fields for yourself. Check this place out. You won't be sorry you did. I couldn't think of a better place to end this video than right here in the middle of the woods, the Battle of the Wilderness, at the hotly contested Brock and Plank Road, Orange Plank Road. Not too far in that direction, Longstreet's wounded. Right here where I'm at right now is a place where men like Wadsworth and Hayes end up losing their lives. Families lose loved ones. Soldiers 
burned to death in these fields around me here. If you'll let these fields do it, they'll touch your soul. Till next time, this is History with Waffles.